Welcome to another edition of WRAL Triangle and Two. I'm Mark Bergen. He's Luis Fernandez. Luis, the NC State Wolfpack are final four bound. This is a sentence I can't believe I'm saying. It feels weird even saying it out loud. I mean, first time in 41 years for the men. Um, on, on the women's side, first time since 1998. Uh, their second time ever. So it's it's just, I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't want to speak out of turn. But I feel like Sunday had to be like a top three moment for NC State basketball fans in general. Like, I, I don't know. It's kind of hard to, besides national championships, I think it's kind of hard to compare. It, what a run. Let's put this into perspective for the listeners and viewers of WRAL Triangle and Two. 1974, the championship with David Thompson back when Sloan was the head coach. Then you had the 83 team as well. There are parallels to the 83 teams, Lewis. Would you like me to get into it? Let's hear it. You you wanted you for for those listening, uh, Mark said he wanted me to genuinely react to these. So I he has not told me what this is. We're I'm just gonna react. All right. So you go back to the ACC tournament, winning mm-hmm. five games, five days. Mm-hmm. The Michael O'Connell banked in three-pointer against Virginia and descended it into an overtime off of a missed free throw. A lot like the 83 team where they also had to win the conference tournament to make March Madness, to make the big tournament. So you got that. I go into this matchup with Purdue and Zach Eady a lot like what did the 83 team need to do to make the final four? They had to beat Ralph Sampson in Virginia. And they three times. So there's that parallel. You also have, if somehow the Wolfpack get by Purdue in the final four, in the championship game, I'm assuming UConn is going to be the representative from the other yeah. Final Four game over Alabama. I, I think that's UConn, right. a parallel to Phi Slamma Jamma with Houston back in the day, would be a huge favorite over NC State. But the fact that we are here going into the conference tournament, there were rumors and questions about Kevin Keats' future at the program. This has been an incredible run. I can't believe we live in a world where NC State's in the Final Four, Duke and UNC are not. It's yeah. been fantastic to watch. It's it's um it is a wild world indeed. Um, but I mean that the thing is, I just NC State has earned every ounce of this success. Like really, mm-hmm. the only game I look at that was like, oh, they probably didn't play that well. What in this this postseason run was the Louisville game, the very first one where you know they did not have DJ Horn and they you know struggled at times, especially defensively against the Louisville. But since that point, they're defensively what they have been able to do has been incredibly impressive. They've had so many different individual players step up, not just DJ Burns and DJ Horn, who are obviously the stars of the show, but the Michael O'Connells of the world hitting that that three, the the fact that that free throw missed from Virginia is ultimately what started this chain reaction is pretty wild. But, um, you know, the uh, Ben Middlebrook scoring 20 points against Texas Tech, uh, you know, Mo Diara uh, playing the way he has while observing Ramadan. Like, it's been amazing to see the the success that they have had. Um, I don't know. It's just this is a very rare opportunity for NC State, and I think they've made the most of it um, in down, on every every turn, every path. So the question now leads to how do you slow down Zach Eady, likely the multi-time player of the year. The reason I compared him to Samson is we'll find out April the 7th, but he's going to win this award over RJ Davis, who is also a finalist among the four to win this award. How you slow him down. I think you take a page and Kevin Keats, I know that you're listening here. I think you take a page. Out of the 83 Wolfpack team, how did they slow down Sanson? The triangle and two, or maybe a box in one defense. I don't think it could just be, oh, let's throw Mo DR on him. I don't think it could be, oh, DJ Burns. I try to do two things. Try to get him in foul trouble, and then try to deny the basketball that Purdue's best player. Well, and I think that's what's so interesting is, so last year, part of the reason why Purdue lost in the first round to a 16 seed was because this team – um, was kind of Zach Eady or bust. Uh, the mm-hmm. team this year, though, with Purdue is a lot more multidimensional. They're one of the better shoot, three-point shooting teams in the country. So when you double um, Eady, who you know doesn't necessarily pass like the best out of double teams, but when you double him, you know you have guys who are wide open and, and hit those shots consistently. 
no doubt. And as you would expect when you get to the final four, this is the best team that state will face. Um, the, the free throw line to me is going to be such a big part of this. Like, do you play without fouling? And it's just, it's so hard. And there is a whole conversation to get into about Zach Eady and free throw attempts and things like that. I don't know if I can get into that at this point. Hang on, but, hang on just a second, Lewis. Let me stop you there because yeah, I want to mention the three-point shooting and piggyback off Okay, your sure, sure. A year ago with this Purdue team, it was uh -huh. a team that shot about 32% from the three-point line. This season, the Boilermakers are almost 41% from the three-point yeah. line. So that, to me, is the big difference of, well, how is Purdue any different this year? Was it just matchups where they got lucky to make the Final Four? No, 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 no. The three-point shooting for Purdue – much improved from a season ago. And if I remember correctly, I think like the top three sh three point per uh, shooting percentage teams are all in the final four. I believe yeah. it's I believe it's UConn, Purdue, and Alabama. I want to say, um, don't quote me on that, but I, I believe it's it's both. All three of those teams are very very good three point shooting teams. Um, you know, so that's what they're gonna have to face. And part of it too is state three point shooting is always weird to me because some of it is defense, but I also think a lot of three point shooting is just kind of is luck. Like, are teams on that day? Are they not on that day? State has done pretty well in terms of three-point defense during this run, especially in the NCAA tournament. Really the only team in the NCAA tournament that has shot, um, you know, above a season average type thing against them is Oakland. And that was the closest game. It went into overtime. So if that three-point shooting continues, you know, there you go. But it's kind of so transitioning from the three-point shooting to the free throws mm -hmm. let's do because, it because so just some numbers here um so in terms of like the teams okay uh, one one stat to kind of look at is fouls per game and then free throw attempts to field goal attempts or for, excuse me free throw attempts per field goal attempts so in terms of fouls per game Purdue is about 13.9 fouls per game and CA is 16.3. So that may not seem like a lot, but that's the difference between like top 10 and, you know, uh, outside of the top 100. The free throw attempts per field goal attempts. Purdue has about 0.422 free throw attempts per field goal attempt. So essentially for every field goal, they're averaging about half a free throw, um, which is top 10 in the country. And the guy who's shooting all of those free throws is Zach Eady. He is first in free throw attempts by 115 free throw attempts. <laughs> like, so, I mean, and he, he's, he's, you know, top score per game in the country. Yep. He averages 25 points per game. I mean, like third, third in rebounding. rebounding. Exactly. Rebounding offensive rebounding. He's first, he gets 4.7 offensive rebounds per game. Like, you know, it's Zach Eady just presents such a dilemma because I do think that there is some of the, and once again, I'm trying to, I'm treading around this carefully. I'm not saying that Zach E is a free throw merchant by any means, but so much of Purdue and how you play Purdue is determined by how the officials blow the whistle that day. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think it was, I, I, the, I believe, what was it? Uh, he shot, Zach, Zach E shot about 24, I believe, free throws against Tennessee. So like he's shooting a lot. He's getting to that line a lot. And then that's obviously going to be a problem if you have guys like DJ Burns or Mo Diara, for example, or Ben Millbrooks picking up those fouls. That's going to be an issue. That's 70. that's one of the it we'll we'll kind of figure out how that's going to be almost immediately in the game. But they have to foul. I mean, they have to defend without fouling. That's going to be huge. 71% from the free throw line for ED as well. So he's not a slouch. He doesn't have some of the same troubles that uh, that plague other big men that play the sport. Offensively, if I'm the Wolfpack, got to go right at him. Got to go right at him and try to get him in foul trouble. That's what he, I would try to do and say, let's fight fire with fire. If it's Burns, if it's Horn, someone attacking the hoop, if it's Diara, let's go right at this dude and make the referees blow the whistle. That's and how because you got to get him off the floor. That's that's the, I would agree. However, that's the thing. Like Zach Eady's also a, a very good defender. His footwork is very good, and the way he plays defense, he does not foul a lot. This Purdue team does not foul a lot in general. He's also number twenty-two in blocks. He averages about two point one six blocks per game. So it is just it is a puzzle. When, when Purdue is clicking, when they are hitting from the outside, and when Zach Eady is getting to the free throw line, they are just hard to 
stop. So it is it is going to be a huge challenge for for NC State. Um, I mean, if you can that uh, truly have Zach Eady not be on the court is probably the best way to beat the uh, the Boilermakers. But you know, I think he he only missed like a minute or so in the game against uh, Tennessee. Like he's he's not one of these bigs that you know will not play a lot of time. He is capable of playing forty minutes. Triangle so. and two or box and one. Get creative. If you don't have the personnel, because it's like, I don't know who's going to match up with them. And again, it's a reason why he's been in play. Like player of the year was it unanimously a year ago. And then he, he won. He won all six national player of the year awards. And why he's in contention and likely going to be the winner come April 7th. Uh, one other player I want to mention from Purdue that you got to slow down. Braden Smith, the sophomore guard uh, among the assist leaders in all of college basketball as well. So it's not just Edie. It's not just a one man show. He gets a lot of the headlines because he's a double, double machine. Purdue it, it, NC state has its work cut out for them come Saturday night, but the battle of the big men, it's, Edie and Burns, like well, get the movie posters ready. I'm ready, Lewis. I'm not trying to so, wish my life away. I'm ready. It's so, it's so interesting, Mark too, because not, I'm not going to say the word interesting. It's, it is cool because they are both large, like, you know, centers, obviously, but they play the game so differently. Uh, you know, uh, DJ Burns had a tied a career high with seven assists, um, even though he wasn't and like, I think it was against Marquette. He only scored like four points. You know what I mean? But he is capable of impacting the game offensively, especially in many different ways. Um, I don't know. I am not a basketball coach, so I don't know the best way to attack Purdue and Zach Eady, but I think that there are ways that you can go about doing it. Um, and really, I think a lot of it's going to come to can that NC State defense that we have seen, can it translate? And can NC State continue to play efficiently on offense? It's going to be big. It's it's going to be really interesting to see. To see said interesting again. Gosh, to see Raleigh rally around this Wolfpack team has been special to watch. Just the scenes from Hillsborough Street on Sunday night, Easter Sunday, and to see everyone at the bell tower, bell towers lit up in red. And I mean, it just gives me chills thinking about it after mm -hmm. the game, Lewis. Uh, I rewatched the 30 for 30 survive in advance and it's a good one. I mean, this is just what living in the triangle is all about, man. Yeah. Like, it's just like in this story, like the 83 team, if you wrote it, if you wrote it and pitched it to a Hollywood director and said, Hey, I want to do a movie about this. And you gave them the script and the synopsis of all these crazy things had to happen to get to this point. You'd have to throw the script out. It wouldn't be believable. And that's that's one thing that I think that the um, that this team has kind of embraced well is they're like, hey, we appreciate the history of these NC State type of runs. We appreciate the history of NC State basketball. We talk to those players. We have that relationship with those people. However, we are not the 83 team. We are different. Um, we, we are creating our own history, our own legacy. And so that's been I have enjoyed hearing them talk about that dynamic because I'm sure it's, you know, any I remember Kevin Keats back in December when they started off, I think it was what, three and one um, in conference play, four and one, five and one conference play, something like that. And he said, you know, anytime you are compared to 74 and 83, you know, both national championships, you're in a pretty good spot. And honestly, if anything, there's almost been too many comparisons to the 83 national championship team um, with this group. But well, it's, it's funny. It's funny how times a flat circle sometimes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And First Final Four run since that season. For the first time they'd been in the Elite Eight since 86. Yep. So, and then you knock off Duke. Now, if you're a Duke fan, you got to take some solace in this, Luis Fernandez. This recruiting class, headlined by Cooper Flag. oh my gosh. And it's like, okay, is Kyle Filipowski or Jared McCain going to come back? They'll probably go pro if I had to guess. I think the, the most recent mock drafts I've seen have them both inside like the top. 20 ish or something like that. Yeah. So. But Cooper flag, this seven foot two, seven foot three kid, uh, common Mulak. If I'm mispronouncing his name, Lewis, I for, forgive me. It's a name we'll become more and more familiar with. Yeah. Because he's going to make it next effect. year. It, it's like this class that you have coming in. If you're a blue devils fan, mm -hmm. take solace in the fact that you weren't supposed to beat Houston in the sweet 16 mm. in this class that you have coming in. I hate to look, beyond this season already but it's like okay which of the triangle teams is best position 
for the 2024-2025 season. Oh, yeah, 100%. To me, Duke's at the top of that list oh, in, when one, it comes to the triangle teams. All, Cooper Flag. that's all you need to know. Cooper <laughs> Flag. Cooper Flag is going to be yeah. very, very special to watch. Yeah. Um, Gatorade and, player of the year, Lewis. Yeah. He, Paulo Bancaro, former Duke guy, presented him the, the award uh, last week. Fun fact. Um, so, yeah, no, it's Duke's going to be just fine. I'm not worried about Duke. Duke's going to be okay. Uh, but it's, I think the, the thing I've been telling myself mm-hmm. this week, I think when you look at Duke, you look at UNC and the way kind of fandoms interact with state and stuff like that. This March, you were not the main character. That's just, that's just what it boils down to this, this March. And now, I guess now it's April. This, this post season, NC state is the main character. Are, does that mean they're going to win it all? No, they, you know, Purdue, they, they still would most likely have to be Purdue and UConn who, if you want to, if they end up being Purdue and UConn, you want to talk about that, that's going to be one of the greater, greatest final fours we've ever seen because that's two hard matchups. But there's, they are the main characters, the way they've captured uh, the hearts of America, the way that uh, people talk about them, um, the way DJ Burns has gotten the notoriety that he has. Yeah. Uh, NC State is, you know, they are the main characters of this March Madness. Luis Fernandez, is there anything else? I know that we will have full coverage all this week. Yes. Leading up to the final four on Saturday in Glendale, Arizona. But uh, this has been another edition of WRL Triangle 2. Is there any coverage specifically that we need to tease between now and Saturday? I know we've got uh, Durham Bulls home opener on yep. Tuesday at the DBAP. Uh, so baseball season's here. Very excited about that. But then, I mean, all week long, we're going to get people ready for Final four runs. And again, don't forget the women either too, Lewis, because you've got two NC State teams in the final four. So as this recording, um, through about four o'clock on a Monday, we do not know what time uh, NC State women's will play. That will be determined by the end of these Elite Eight games with UConn and Southern Cal and uh, Iowa and LSU, which, my goodness, those games are going to be fun. Must must watch TV. Must watch TV. Yeah. Yeah. But um, (laughs) the – so we'll find out once those games are finished when they will play, but we do know it'll be Friday and we do know that NC state will be playing uh, undefeated South Carolina. And there are so many fun storylines that revolve around that, you know, um, Sanaya rivers uh, playing her first year at South Carolina. Um, Isaiah James being, I believe the only player left from um, uh, NC state's double overtime game against UConn in the elite eight, a few years back uh, Westmore finally getting into the final four for the first time in his career. Uh, you know, there there are there are a lot of really fun storylines with both these NC State teams. And, you know, it is going to be a really fun finish to uh, March. That's for sure. I'm telling you this, man, the Wolfpack bring one national title or maybe multiple national titles. Ra- Raleigh's going to turn into Babylon, Lewis. I'm telling you right now. It's, uh, you know, it's funny because I know we, we joke about how many like, you know, um, uh, bonuses and contract extensions and things that Kevin Keats has gotten over the past, you know, two, three weeks by making this run. I uh, just b- bake the statue. If, if, if NC state wins a national championship, make the statue, just, just get the plans drawn up. That's, that's where they're at. I think he's Luis Fernandez. I'm Mark Bergen. Thank you for watching another edition of WRAL triangle and two Apple and Spotify. Please leave us a five-star review and on the YouTube page on 99, nine, the fan hit that subscribe button. Keep it here all week long, leading up to the NC State Final Four matchups. Lewis, you're the absolute best. Sign off for the both of us. Take care. So long, everybody.